Welcome to Retina Health for Life from the President's Corner, brought to you by the American Society of Retina Specialists. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Murray, coming to you from Miami. On each episode, we'll bring you inspiring conversations about your sight and the special role the retina plays in making healthy vision possible. We'll hear from expert retina specialists, as well as directly from patients about living life to the fullest with retinal disease. Join us and learn how to safeguard your retina health for life. Hi, I'm Dr. Timothy Murray, welcoming you to the ASRS's Retina Health for Life from the President's Corner. It's my real pleasure today to introduce the topic of diabetic retinopathy. And to do that, I'm going to have one of our experts, Dr. Sophie Bakri from the Mayo Clinic, join us today. We're gonna talk about how diabetic retinopathy a complication of diabetes can lead to blindness, but more importantly, how with early diagnosis and treatment by a retina specialist, vision loss can be totally avoided. So it's really a pleasure to have Dr. Sophie Bakri with me. Hello, Sophie. Hello, Tim, and thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Really glad to have you here. So we're gonna focus, Sophie, on something that you and I deal with sort of day in and day out, which is diabetic ocular disease or diabetic retinopathy, which as we both know, unfortunately, is an incredibly common condition. It's reported now to affect approximately 8 million Americans, but we think that that number may actually double within the next two decades. So it's a little scary to think um, how, how much of an issue this may be for us. So to get us started, could you take us through a little bit about what is diabetic retinopathy, what are the causes, and what are the risk factors? Sure. Well, diabetic retinopathy is caused by diabetes. And let's, I'll start by calling it diabetes mellitus because there are other unrelated um, types of uh, uh, conditions. So really the single biggest risk factor for getting diabetic retinopathy is the duration of diabetes um, and also the level of control of diabetes. Um, there are other things that come into play such as high blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol, and we also know that diabetic retinopathy is exacerbated uh, by pregnancy. So, you know, I think one of the things that we talk about and, and actually has really become sort of a common topic with the pandemic is, the, is this concept of comorbidities. So you've mentioned that the diabetes mellitus is the primary condition, but also, you know, have associated that with maybe hypertension playing a role or pregnancy playing a role. Um, when you have your patients with you in the clinic, what do you discuss with them about things that they can do when they are seeing you that may play a role in lowering their risk of, of um, progressive diabetic retinopathy? Yeah, so anything that improves diabetes um, can improve diabetic retinopathy or at least try to stabilize it over the long term. So I talk to my patients about a few things. Um, firstly, sugar control, uh, the importance of diet, seeing a dietitian, uh, taking one's medications, and also controlling any high blood pressure uh, that is also present because that is one of the most um, serious comorbidities in diabetic retinopathy. And along with that, I encourage them to um, take regular exercise, uh, of course, pay attention to their diet um, and cholesterol. So I think that those are, you know, I think that those are the critical factors that we really discuss so that, you know, the, the patients play a major role in sort of the control of their disease. And by controlling their, their diabetes, they actually can lower their risks of blinding related complications. The other thing that's, that's unfortunately coming back, it seems, is, is smoking. And we're seeing that um, many of our younger patients, when we had gone through a decade where people were smoking rarely, um, seem to be taking smoking up a, as, a, as a habit again. And that appears to play a major role also um, in the morbidity associated with your diabetes. I totally agree, um, Tim. And because smoking was somewhat going out of fashion, I think it's something that we um, uh, got less used to discussing, um, but, but I agree. And um, it's really important to um, bring that home as well. 
And then, um, Sophie, the patients come in usually very aware of what their, their blood sugar rates are from their finger tests. What is the other test that's really important to you that looks at long-term control of, of blood sugar? So as physicians, we tend to look at the A1C. And typically when we ask patients about what their sugar control has been like, you're absolutely right. They talk about the latest finger stick number, but the A1C gives us a measure of blood glucose uh, over the past three months. And so that's what we look at as physicians. Now, a number such as you know, five, 5.5, six would be on the lower end of A1Cs. And on the high end, you can get numbers um, you know, of 12 or, or even higher, which would indicate very poor control of diabetes. Yeah, so I find that number helpful because it gives you more of an idea of what the chronic sugar risk has been over the last several months, as you've, as you've said. But it surprises me, Sophie, that so few of my patients actually know what their hemoglobin A1C level is. So I think that it, it really ties in nicely also to most of the patients that we see on a regular basis come to us a little later in the disease course than we would like. So what do you think would be ideal for, for your patients to educate them um, before they come to see a retina specialist? Because once you get them, I feel like we can manage them well. Great question. Well, I happen to think that the education really should begin in the primary care physician's office. Um, when, when, when the physician has a discussion about the complications of, of diabetes, you know, diabetic retinopathy is really one of the most important complications. And the, um, uh, the, the long-term sequelae of diabetic retinopathy can actually be prevented. So I think it starts in the physician's office. And then now there are a lot of tools such as photographic screening um, even combined with artificial intelligence that can do these um, regular screenings without the patient needing to come to the retina specialist's office yet. Now, I think it's uh, important for every diabetic to be connected uh, with an ophthalmologist uh, because we can be right there to intervene um, when, um, when we get to that point but I think the initial screenings and education should all begin at the primary care physician's office. So I, I think you're right. So many of our patients have a primary care practitioner or some of them may be a diabetologist or an endocrinologist. Um, and, I, and I think they're very aware of the risk for a heart attack and stroke and, and, and the risk for kidney disease. But, but often I think they're um, not really as aware as we would like them to be of their vision risk. So um, I like the patients to come in earlier, even than may be recommended by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, because I feel like one look early in their disease gives me an opportunity to really counsel them from a, from a vision perspective. And the other thing that we really um, push for is, of course, when they're being seen by an, by an ophthalmologist, always hoping that that ophthalmologist provides a dilated fundus exam. We talk over and over again about how important a dilated exam is. You've really stressed the imaging component of that, which is wide field photography or even the optical coherence tomography that can let us look almost at a microscopic level at the macula. But I think it's important. Most of the patients, when they come to me the first time, have never had a dilated eye exam. Sometimes patients in their 50s and 60s, long into the course of their disease. Do you have any thoughts on that? So I agree. I mean, as a retina specialist, I dilate every single retina patient, um, and especially every single uh, diabetic. And, um, you know, we have such great instruments aside from photographic tools to examine um, the retina. And so we always start with the dilated um, examination. And then we can take things from there. I think, as, as you mentioned, uh, wide field photography um, allows us to really keep uh, the baseline images um, stored. So for comparisons um, and optical coherence tomography that shows us a cross section of the retina can really um, tell us a lot about the health of the retina, but especially the macula, which is the part of the retina centrally that sees um, uh, the fine vision. So we like to look for swelling, we like to look for, for lipid accumulation. 
you know, even subtle findings such as, you know, pulling uh, the, the vitreous jelly pulling on the retina. Uh, these are all um, things that uh, we need to monitor and at some point uh, perhaps uh, treat. Now, talking about imaging tools, the, the, the tools that we have continue to improve um, in ophthalmology. There is uh, fluorescein angiography, where a dye is injected um, in the vein and circulates uh, into the eye and shows us the blood flow. And now there's also a non-invasive imaging test, an OCT angiogram, that gives us great details of the fine uh, vessels uh, in the macula. As a retina specialist, we're able to put the, um, all these tools together really and have a really good picture of that patient's current state, but also their prognosis and um, an idea of when we need to intervene. So Sophie, I think that's so important. I you know, feel like we've really come to um, two major advances in diabetic retinopathy. One, which you've talked about the ability to image the eye in, in such a precise way, but it's that ability to image the eye that now I think has been coupled with our ability to treat these patients um, in some unique ways that really allow us to preserve the function of the eye and, and potentially to maintain excellent vision for our patients. So historically, and I'm, a, and I'm significantly older than you, the treatment that we had available to us for diabetes was laser treatment. Um, and I feel, and I think you might agree that we've really moved away from laser in a significant way toward the use of these intravitreal injections that many of our patients have heard about that allow us to target the disease on a molecular level. Can you walk us through anti-VEGF treatments for, for diabetes and why they're, they're so important and how they may function? So anti-VEGF therapy has really been revolutionary um, for the management of diabetic retinopathy, but also for, for the management of diabetic uh, macular edema. And uh, when they were initially approved, we would treat diabetic macular edema, which is the swelling in the uh, center of the uh, retina. And um, you know, when patients receive an injection, um, the eye gets numbed, the eye gets cleaned and sterilized. And really, it's a, it's a really fine uh, needle that is inserted um, into the vitreous cavity to deliver a small amount of medication right where we need it, uh, right um, to the vitreous to reach the retina. Now, the thing with anti-VEGF agents in their current state is that they need to be given frequently, sometimes every month, sometimes you know, every couple of months. Um, and the nice thing about them is they don't just treat the swelling in the center of the vision. Um, recent clinical trials have shown that they can actually not only slow down diabetic retinopathy, but actually reverse the appearance of diabetic retinopathy. So in the past, as you said, um, Tim, we would wait for a certain critical point in the disease process and then put in laser which is panretinal photocoagulation. It's, it's, it's a laser that, that's put all the way around the periphery to preserve the center. And we would do that to reduce vision loss okay, and reduce the rate of vision loss. So what we're doing now is revolutionary in that we can actually reverse diabetic retinopathy. So I think that's incredible. Yeah, me too. You know, when we started with the laser, it was one of those counterintuitive approaches where you actually use the laser beam to destroy part of the retina to preserve the center function of the retina. And now that we've moved to anti-VEGFs, it's, it's a non-destructive treatment that really improves the retina throughout the eye so that we don't have to functionally save one part of the eye at the expense of another. I, I find that those have been just huge advances. Now, we know that some of our patients still need laser surgery to support the anti-VEGF, but I found that laser, which was a common practice in, in our uh, retina specialty service now is a significantly um, rare event. And that's kind of been a huge transition for me that I think has made our ability to treat our patients significantly better, but also I think has improved the overall function for our patients. I completely agree. And I think 
as for years, we've all been treating patients with diabetic macular edema as a side effect of that macular edema treatment, um, it has actually ret uh, retarded or even reversed diabetic retinopathy. And um, as a consequence, we've needed to put in um, less uh, laser. So it, it's, been, it's been good all around. But I would add that diabetic patients really have to have a great relationship with their retina specialist and have to come back frequently because it's, it, it's gaps in treatment that can cause um, a problem and gaps in follow-up. So it's important to have a regular follow-up. And again, I think that's been highlighted through the pandemic where some of our patients have really been very concerned about coming into the office and in many instances have de de you know, delayed their appointments. And we're seeing significant um, loss of function for those patients where their vision has decreased and, and their anatomy has worsened. So I think it really does tell us that this is a disease that requires an active relationship between the retina specialist and, and the patient. So if you, we, we're kind of talking about two different types of, of vision loss with diabetes, one being the swelling of the retina, the macular edema, and the other being the proliferative retinopathy where abnormal blood vessels grow. I think one of the things that I like to stress with the patients is that often there can be a significant impact of diabetes before the patient has really any symptoms. Do you see that in your practice also? Definitely. Um, I think that in many cases, diabetic retinopathy can be you know, a silent disease. And in those cases, we are really lucky if we can intervene before the devastating complications of diabetic retinopathy occur. So again, as you highlighted, Tim, it's really important to have our patients screened, follow up and maintain a relationship with the retina specialist um, so that we don't get to them too late. Yeah, I agree. So many of my patients are like, well, you know, you know, Dr. Murray, I'll come to you when I, when I see blurring of my vision or if I have sudden flashing lights or floating spots. And, and for most of our patients, waiting for those as the symptoms that trigger an urgent visit is appropriate. But I think that doesn't work for our patients with diabetes where you may have significant retinopathy or significant diabetic macular edema and not really have symptoms that, that can guide you to return to the retina specialist. I do think it really comes down to that component of education that we, that we talk about over and over and over again. So Sophie, one of the things that, that I think that is exciting for us is where is the future going for our patients with diabetic ocular disease with their retina specialist? How do you see diabetes looking five years from now? What, what's on the horizon for our patients? So I think the future is very exciting and there's a lot of very promising treatments for diabetic retinopathy. Um, I hope that with these treatments, we will see less and less diabetic retinopathy, just like we're doing fewer and fewer lasers. So, you know, as I mentioned, um, injections now need to be given every month or every couple of months, and hopefully you know, less and less so with time. But there are treatments that deliver the same medications long term to the retina. Um, one such treatment, for example, is, is a port that's inserted um, into the eye and, and it's refillable. Um, other long-term treatments um, include gene therapy. And gene therapy is really a very exciting field, uh, not only in diabetic retinopathy, but in other retinal diseases. And, and wouldn't it be great if our patients could just have one treatment and then be done? I mean, that's really a pipeline dream and, and I hope it happens. Yeah, I'm with you too. So I see it, I see us moving forward in two ways. One, as you've said, trying to lower the burden of treatment so that we, we can take care of our patients in a way that keeps them from having to return over and over again and be retreated. The second thing maybe is in, is in our diabetologist and endocrinologist hands where they have the potential potentially to eliminate diabetes for our patients entirely. So that we think if you could control the systemic component of the diabetes, there's very good evidence that you will never have diabetic related ocular disease. So this is one of those diseases that I think you and I would love to see leave our office entirely if we could assure our patients really excellent vision. 
But until that happens, I think the key for us is getting those patients into, into our office to a retina specialist, having a dilated fundus exam where the pupil is dilated, imaging examinations and allowing us to assess the status of the diabetic retinopathy so that we can give those prognostic signs and appropriate follow-up timing. So I think that's kind of exciting to see the advances. And I feel like what we do with our patients now has virtually eliminated blinding complications from diabetes for those patients that see us early in the course of their disease. Incredibly exciting time. So Sophie, thank you so much for joining us um, and joining me. I'll encourage our, our patients and our public to visit um, to our other podcasts on YouTube. Um, and also to know that we have information available at the ASRS website at asrs.org backslash patients. And you can follow us for information on retinal health, both on Facebook and Twitter. So Dr. Sophie Bakri joining us from the Mayo Clinic. Thank you so much. Um, an excellent conversation. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to the ASRS. <laughs>